in this thing. It's so Brant's Petrie. Oh wait. Somebody else. So Brant Petrie, who wrote this book. Uh, so I came across him. Actually, there was a, uh, it was called a retreat. It was more like a continuing ed for priests at Ogilvy uh, about probably three or four years ago. And they had Scott Hahn and Brant Petrie and uh, Bergsma, uh, all these guys. So that's the first time I heard of him. And he gave a talk as he did as he was in his book. Um, but he has a lot of stuff on the uh, website on his website. So if you ever want more on Grant, Grant Petrie, uh, look him up on his web. He even has something. I don't I do not do it. I think it's a pay for it, so I'm out. But uh, for like, <laughs> I think for priests, uh, just the upcoming like weekly scriptures, like he has this thing you could subscribe to and basically explaining the first reading, second reading of the gospel. So the guy's really obviously a talented guy, uh, but he is good. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I read this before, but obviously honing in on it now, uh, when I'm talking about it, uh, but it is it is beautiful. So I'm I'm getting a lot out of it myself. So just to look at the style, this thing could easily be two hour session. So we're going to keep it here going on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, this is a tight squeeze. We made it kind of tight because the attractiveness. You know, I mean, it's like in this could have easily been longer. Yeah. So we're jamming two and three. I think last week was a lot lighter, and it was intro and chapter one. And two and three got heavier, uh, and it's a lot. Uh, so we just did that, obviously, we're trying to get it in the Latin journey. And, you know, so we could have stretched it out more. And also the classes themselves uh, to be an hour and 15 minutes just to make it attractive. You know, if we go a few minutes after, I mean, I'm fine with that. I don't want to hold you too long. But uh, so it is a lot. And then we break it up. We're looking at the book, the overview, and we break it up with questions. And, you know, you like to do that, which is great. I like to do all that. Uh, but anyway, there's just a lot in here. So we'll take a look at So what I like to do is just, I'll overview it. I have no watch on me at all because my cell phone, I don't have a watch. And it's in my cell and I don't know what time it is at all. Um, so if you tell me about, let's see, if, if somebody, Mike, you could tell me about 20, 20 after, just kind of wait. Because um, it takes a while to do those, those questions here too. So what I like to do is just do some of the overview, just like ride through some of this. and then. Just rely on the Holy Spirit a lot where I stop and add things and see where the Lord's going to take me, okay? So looking at, we're in chapter two, so we're on uh, page 22. And I apologize, some people do not have a book. So um, we, we're we out at St. Angelo's. So tomorrow at Mass at St. Patrick, and I'll bring what we have left over there. So there's like two of you that needed a book. So I'll get them up here tomorrow. So if you can call the office. Uh, we'll work on giving you a book, okay? We would leave it outside, and if some of you work, we'll, we'll put it out so you can do it. So sorry about that. Uh, two people, I think, do not have books. So what kind of Messiah? So what were the Jewish people waiting for? So that's a, that's a, a big question there. Uh, what kind of Messiah? So interestingly enough, the, the normal thing that we think about is, and I mean, it's tough when you're, this guy's a theologian. It's not, the guy's not like the voice of the church, like the definitive answer. You know what I mean? These guys are theologians. And he's great, but these guys are theologians. So what they're doing is they're putting out like true statements and all that. But the, when you're talking about God, you're talking about a, a huge, I mean, you can't even capture it. So he's giving you different uh, sort of versions of the expectations, right? So it's not so much like it's a right or wrong thing. So when I was in seminary, St. Paul Seminary, we had uh, Father Joe Kleffner, who was the, uh, the rector at that time. And like, we would always laugh because we would like, whatever the theological thing was, we would say, uh, well, so Father uh, Joe, it's like Father Kleffner. It's like this, right? And then it, which one is it? And he would say, uh, both and. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's how he talks. So we, I can, he, he's in heaven now. But he would say, uh, right, both and. And that's what it reminds me of when we're talking, trying to capture especially you know the messiah what were people expecting what were they looking for it's a both and uh you know answer here that we're talking about so what he does is he runs with a common notion and he gives it some yeah you know a lot of credence to say yeah this is true you know what is the common expectation he said yeah this is true so this is the political king david uh, messiah so remember that israel the jewish people are suppressed by the romans so at that time in Israel, the talk of the town is when Mashiach comes. Can you imagine being the Israeli people 
suppressed by the Romans. So now the talk of the town is when Moshiach comes, when Messiah comes, these people are wiped out and Israel's restored back to power, right? So that's like the thought. So that's like the milieu that Christ is coming in uh, at that time. And so that's when the, the Romans are suppressing. So that's a common, um, you know, notion of that. And at the, if I hope I get time, but I want to go back to something I pulled out. Uh, the Jew, it's always interesting to see the Jewish expectation of the Messiah because we're reading, uh, you know, a Christian. I mean, he's right. He's trying to get the Jewish notion of that, but we're always, you know, we're, we're grabbing the whole people church kind of thing. So what is what is it if you ask the Jewish person? What's the Messiah look like? And so I got something on here. Hopefully, I have time to share. Um, so anyway, so that's a common one there. And then what he does is it's beautiful. I mean, what he does. And so we're into the both and. And so the both and is going to be what he lays out. So he's laying out. We're just going to go through these. So the Jewish hope for a new Exodus. So he's saying it not just like a political King David figure that's going to come and wipe out the Romans and restore Israel back to power, right? Um, and restore the temple, right? So what he's saying is a new Exodus, and he's on uh, 23, going on 24. So he's taking it to, to Moses. Uh, the years, roughly, we say Abraham about 2,000 years ago, then Moses 1,500 years, and then uh, King David 1,000 years, and then getting into Christ, right? So he's talking about uh Moses, you know, one of the greatest guys that ever lived here. The, and then he gets into, I don't think I need to explain all this, the, the Exodus, we kind of, we all know that, right? So the Exodus event, and that's the deliverance of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt, right? And so now we have this uh, new Exodus. So he takes us through uh, these four major points here, and he says the new Moses. So that's powerful. It's like so hopeful when we read this kind of stuff. So the new deliverer, right? So Moses, he's this guy that God just showered with this kind of grace to, to lead the people out of slavery, the deliverer, right? So then we have Moses, and then we have the new Moses, who's greater than Moses, right? And so Jesus, so he he comes with this new exodus, and I mean, we lay it out here, but the new exodus, obviously, would be his death on the cross and his rising, and he, the new exodus is he's leading us out, not from uh, slavery to bondage with slavery to sin and death so that's the new exodus uh in a nutshell so that's the whole summary of the book but no um, <laughs> but anyway uh remember this folks it's always the paschal mystery all right another thing that the, in the seminary is like i remember one of the guys you know you got your six years of uh of the different studies and like everything and anything, especially like if you were on a test or getting caught, uh, like as far as like, what's the, what am I going to say? What's the answer? Uh, what well, all goes back to the Paschal mystery. And the Paschal mystery from Pesach is Passover. So the Passover mystery is Jesus passing over from death to life. So that's the center of it all, right? Is the Paschal mystery. Life is the Paschal mystery. All those, all the sacraments we have are all the Paschal mystery, right? So the new, uh, the new uh, Moses he has, and he lays out all of Exodus. And then interestingly enough, I love these guys. He's really good at laying this stuff out, but it's always neat. I think he's a great uh, explainer of things, but the way he's laying out um, the, the, um, the uh, exile, when they're in exile. So he is the first one. This is uh, 26. These are huge, by the way, that, uh, the Babylon, the Assyrian <laughs> Empire, right? So these are the big exile moments, 722 BC and 10 northern tribes. So we have the 10, 12 tribes of Israel, right? Uh, the sons of Jacob. And so we have 722 BC, uh, the Assyrian Empire, 10 of the northern tribes are in exile. Then 587 BC is the two remaining southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So it, it's the time of exile. So you have that going on. So there's like that, so we have it all converging. So that's long before the Romans come, but you have that kind of talk, that kind of thought. And he doesn't do um, a lot of this, but I mean, it goes back to Genesis, you know? I mean, he, he doesn't, I mean, these guys could do all that, but, it, you know, he's focusing on a, a certain topic, but going back to Genesis, you know, I'll put, host, I'll put enmity, enmity, which is hostile distance between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours. 
So we're already talking about the Messiah. You know, we're talking about uh, this hostile distance. Remember in that in Genesis 3.15, where he says to Satan, I'm going to put hostile distance between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours. You're going to strike uh, at his heel while he strikes at your head, you know? So that's that's like the Redeemer's coming, you know? So it's it's before this. We got a Savior on the way to save us from sin and death. So it all ties back into that, right? Genesis ties into how uh, Adam and Eve, how do they sin? By taking from the tree. How does the Lord redeem us? By hanging on a tree. He used the same weapon that Adam and Eve had the downfall of humanity with. He said, why well, have to use a tree? They, the uh, original sin happened through a tree. So I'm going to save humanity through a tree, the cross. And also humanity fell. So I'm going to take on humanity. I need humanity to do that. He could do anything he wants to work, but he chooses to do it through humanity, taking on the human flesh and entering into us to redeem humanity. So I just point that out. He, I don't think he really runs with all that. Obviously, he knows all that, but um, just to kind of keep that the whole thing, the, the deliverers coming, not just the thought of the Moses time. Um, and then, he, yeah, it's really beautiful. He's bringing in the prophecy of Isaiah here. Um, and and, he, and he's really neat with all these other books that he's coming through with. I mean, I, I'm i not old. I mean, I know of them, but not like, I don't know, these inside and out, like the, these different ones that he's using. So he's really uh, pulling the quotes out from there. So this new yeah. delivery is going to, and then also too, I love on the end part of that, the last chapter, uh, he's talking about the Messiah coming on a donkey, uh, was alive and well in the first century. And for our purposes here, the main point is that in this particular rabbinic tradition, the Messiah is clearly expected to be a new Moses. And so he's talking about riding upon a donkey, thereby fulfilling the biblical prophecy of Zechariah. So we have, and this is all exciting. So we're thinking we have the deliverer, right? The new deliverer, the new Exodus, the new Moses, you know, coming. So just really this hopeful stuff here. And then the next one is the new covenant. So covenants are gigantic, right, in the Bible. In the first Exodus, God uh, made a covenant, a sacred family bond uh, with between himself and the people of Israel. So it's that that uh, loving relationship, right? Not a contract, you know, uh, but that's more like an agreement, like legal agreement kind of thing. But a covenant is like entering heart to heart, like entering into this union with through love, you know. Um, so the covenant of marriage, you know, not the contract of marriage, but a covenant of marriage covenant in love uh so he, and then he this is neat how he ties this all in with the the first covenant the covenant of following the ten commandments um the sacrificial worship it's always i mean i think that's one of your questions but it's it's sealed with the government right um and then he talks at the end at 29 about uh the blood covenant is sealed in blood right in blood we know as the as he says i think in the prior chapter was the life the soul so the blood of the covenant and I was, so, I was thinking of, as he put it, like blood brothers, because he says here um, on the top of 30, by means of this ritual, God makes Israel to be his own family, his own flesh and blood. By means of this action, they now share the same blood. They are now family. So we're always thinking about the Lord's blood, right? That, and we receive the Lord's blood. We drink his blood. So it, I'm thinking there, you ever see like those movies, they do like blood brothers, you know, they cut, right. cut their hand and it was like, okay, we're blood brothers. So I was thinking about that uh, when he uses this. And then the meal. So yeah, it's just screaming with Eucharist here, right? I mean, you could tell where he's kind of moving and, and laying this thing out. Um, so we have, you know, the sacrifice and then we have the, the, the meal. And... Let's see what else. So, yeah, just the, the new covenant. And, yeah, he just lays out uh, the different covenants. Almost a thousand years of time. All right. So any thoughts on that? I mean, and then we think of um, of the Lord coming with the, the ultimate covenant uh, that's going to be sealed in his blood. Uh, so we have the, the on the cross and then the meal is always the <laughs> Eucharist. Um, and then the new temple. So this is big also. Uh, that the tabernacle of Moses, the portable temple, so uh, the a tent. So it's amazing too. Um, in here on thirty three, I I found that neat when he laid out 
uh, how big the temple was, the tabernacle, 75 feet by 150 feet. Um, so it's not too big. <laughs> 150 feet by 75 feet. Can you imagine like the Vatican compared to that? You know, like, like the, the, in the temple, they, as he pointed out, the temple they built in the Solomon Temple was massive. You know, that would be on lines of our Vatican, you know, when they, when they had the permanent uh, temple that they built. So this new temple, um, so, and this is the central place of worship, this new temple. And, and then what is in the temple? What's in the tabernacle? According to the book of Exodus, it consisted of three parts. There was the outer court, uh, which contained the bronze altar of sacrifice, on which the priests would offer animal sacrifices to God. And second, moving inward, there was the holy place, which contained three sacred objects, the golden lamps of the menorah, which the Jewish people light, and, light, and the golden altar of incense, and the golden table of 12 cakes, known as the bread of the presence. He's going to talk about that in upcoming chapters. And then the in this holy place, the priest of Israel, sorry, and then the third is the holy of holies. So there, in the holy of holies, you can stand there when you go to Israel now, is they have the place of the original holy of holies. It's like it's outside of the temple area, and they have this like place marked as like a sort of a tent over it. Not tent, but like a uh, marble thing over top of it. And um, yeah, you can like walk in and see it. And you can't see it. There's nothing there. It's just a spot where the Holy of Holies lie. So in the Holy of Holies was the Golden Ark of the Covenant, which contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments and the urn of the man. And remember the man in the desert and the staff of Aaron. We don't know where that is. They can move to where that, where that is right now. But we don't know where that is. Um, Indiana Jones, I think. So. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he went looking for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he was looking for the uh, Holy Grail. Did you see that? Yeah, uh, that was a yeah, like a, when he was trying the Holy Grail of Jesus. We don't know where that is. That would be the Holy Grail. so anyway. Um, yeah, so who knows if we'll discover that um, one day? How could that staff fit in there? I mean, if it's that small. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I don't know the exact measurements of that. It might have been. Big, they just say big, how big this, the tabernacle. Yeah, is. the yeah. tent. But that could have. Been, I mean, they would have built it to fit that. They would have built it huge. So the main <laughs> point is that the tabernacle of Moses, the place of worship during the Exodus, became the prototype for a permanent place of worship. And then this is where he gets in the temple of Solomon, which was massive, built several hundred years after Moses and almost a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, was essentially a bigger, much more splendid version of the tabernacle. Um, and so that's the, you know, the new temple. Um, it, it, uh, you know, the, the coming, the expectation. And that's in the Jewish one that I pulled up too, is this uh, this new temple um, that it, it, he establishes. You know? and, and the gather of nations, a big thing too is the coming of the Messiah, is the gathering of nations. He brings that up here somewhere, but He's going to bring those tribes that are moved around all over the place. That he comes to gather the nations, uh, the Messiah. So, any other? Uh, but yeah, then he, he's agreed to bringing in on thirty-five here. Uh, the Old Testament prophets had spoken with greater and greater frequency of a future temple. So we had the existing temple, and then the temple was wiped out, right? In uh, in seventy A.D. Um, remember that's that's. Uh, you, they have remnants of the temple over there, but 70 AD uh, strikes it down. So this new temple, and what does that look like in, in the Lord? The new temple is the church, right? So the new temple is the body of Christ. Um, he does, yeah. So the body of Christ is that that new temple. Jesus says uh, on the third day, um, I will, I will uh, lower this temple and rebuild it in, on the third day. And he said, remember God in the scripture, he says, this temple's been there 46 years. How are you going to rebuild the temple? He's talking about the temple of his body. So the temple, the new temple is, is the body of Christ, right? The church. So, all right. And so, yeah, he's bringing in... Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which comes shortly before the coming of the life of Christ, just laying out all these where this is in these scriptures and in these other writings. And the new promised land. So the Messiah expectations, this new temple is going to be established. And, um, 
and the new promised land. The, and this is, I mean, essentially what he's saying here is we can't really think of it like as an earthly land, you know. And he goes to uh, some of the, the Jewish writers, some of these documents that he's going to uh, have the promised land is it, not so much thinking of it as like the earthly place, like the Messiah is going to come and establish this new promised land. Ultimately, the promised land is we're going to heaven, right? So you can't like confine it and just say, like we could be so earthy, right? As I said in the opening prayer about detachment, like to detach, detach from the world. So he's talking about the world to come. So, I mean, it's in seed here, the, the new temple, the church. So we're, the kingdom is among us. And in here, he refers to uh, part of that uh, when he talks about the um, the new promised land, he said you could even equate that like to the kingdom of God. So it's it's around us. So like remember Christ says that it's not like look over there, there it is, it's over here, it's over here. It's it's among us. The kingdom is among us, right? So it's in seed in this this new temple that the Lord builds. It's not a brick and mortar. Um, it's this new temple, this body, this new temple. In the Lord, that's how the Messiah comes. He, you know, he's he's not thinking of the physical structures. Say like the Vatican's going to hold the holy of that. Way. No, no, the Lord's talking about the whole ball of wax here. So he comes and he establishes this the the temple, the church, this new kingdom among us, and then the fullness of that kingdom, which we could see and we're a part of. But the fullness of that kingdom, the promised land, they're coming from. Remember that Exodus, the first Exodus, is they're coming from slavery going to the promised land of Canaan or Israel. And then the Lord's coming with this new uh, with this new exodus and it's above and beyond the earthly reality. You know, how can that, how, I mean, we, what else would we want? Well, I want the earthly reality of this giant, beautiful church in Rome. I mean, that's beautiful. I want to go to heaven, right? <laughs> so he's up with the Lord. Like, it's amazing too, how the Lord like turns these things upside down. Some of them, like you can't confine them to, to all these things. But he's saying that the new promised land, I mean, I'm taking you to heaven. I'm not taking you out of Egypt, out of slavery to go to Israel. I'm taking you out of this world to go to the heavenly paradise, the promised land. You know, he always turns this thing upside down, Jesus, right? It's amazing to go for the ride with the Lord. Sometimes scary to go for the ride. But uh, he's the one who takes us to places that we never thought of, right? And he's talking about the Jewish... Uh, some of these writings, you get to like 40, 41, he's talking about um, some of the world to come as scholars have recognized in this Jewish tradition, inheriting the land is equated with having a share in the world to come, a common rabbinic expression for the new world of the age of salvation, you know, and then the future world. So, and it would involve a journey to a new promised land in the new Jerusalem. Apparently, this new land would be far greater than that which had been promised to Moses. It would be no ordinary land, but a part of the world to come. You know, so the Lord takes it to another level. So, all right. And we have, and then he, he does a nice job with all these chapters to like summarize them too. Uh, so Jesus in the, the new Exodus, so he takes a look at that. Um, and also on page 43, uh, this guy's, they're all important, but this Joseph this is neat uh, because he's a historian. So he's a famous historian, this Joseph is. You may have heard of him before, um, but what's neat about it, I don't have it now if anyone wants to look it up online, but there's like a line or two Joseph is has Jesus historically reported. It's not a whole lot, but it says uh, the Jesus that they thought may be the Messiah, something along those lines. It's like one or one or two lines, and, and he was he's a great, like the greatest historian at that time. But it's neat because that's uh, we always cling to that as historical evidence for the existence of Jesus. Because if you argue with the Gospels, people say, "Oh, it's a bunch of they all believe that stuff. That's all religion." And then you go to Josephus. And you say, oh, whoa, that's a secular uh, historian. And he has a line, I think it's like one liner on the Lord, something like the, you will find it online, but uh, like the, the Jesus who was thought to be or something, the Messiah, and they killed him or something like that. He was crucified. Um, but it's like really neat when you, were you able to back up um, 
what we believe with historical evidence like that. So this is Josephus, uh, uh, this uh, second chapter. To the contrary, the Jewish historian Josephus gives us reports suggesting the idea of a new exodus was so widespread in first century AD that several popular Jewish figures actually promised to be able to perform miracles that would harken back to the exodus from Egypt. So he's just bolstering, uh, you know, the claim that the thought, you know, the streets were, yeah, there's a new exodus on the way. So we're back to that both and. You got the Davidic fi figure and you got the Moses figure uh, coming all together here. So it's, it, you know, it's hard to like really capture it all and just say, what's well, this one or that one? It's both images are, are happening here. Um, and... Uh, yeah, then he summarizes this at the end by going into the desert and fasting for 40 days, just as Moses had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. He's drawing these parallels. Uh, Jesus, And this one, Jesus transforms water into wine as the first of his signs, just as Moses had transformed water into blood as one of the first signs against Pharaoh. Um, so, and he also has, uh, likewise, according to the prophet Jeremiah, at the time of the new exodus, God will make a new covenant with his people, which will be greater than the covenant made when God brought them out of the land of Egypt. So how does Jesus end his public ministry in the upper room on the, on the night before he died? Takes a cup of wine, says this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant. But he'll lay that out more. Um, but he's, he, as we go on, we'll talk more about the, the next chapter is more so about that. Um, Okay, and yeah, he's just saying in short, in short, the people were awaiting a new exodus in Israel. So you line it all up, it was exciting. I mean, you got obviously the Davidic notion, then you got the, here he comes a great deliverer, he's going to lead us out from sin and death uh, in this new covenant that's going to, uh, what precedes the, like the meal in this preceded the exodus. So the last supper is the meal that's going to precede his dying uh, on the cross, the new exodus, right? And then, this, so that's the covenant established in his blood. What's the temple? The new temple? The church. The new temple is the, the kingdom of God, the people of God. It's all around us. It's not like, look over there, look over there. It's among you. You're among the kingdom. We're in this room. We're among the kingdom. We're among the, uh, the new temple that is among us right now, with all of us here talking about the Lord, uh, trying to grow in his love. And then the promised land, Jesus just says, you can't confine me to like <laughs> dirt and grass in some pretty area. We're going, folks. We're going up to the heavenly realm. We're going up to the promised land. This is the new promised land. You know, I love that. And this is great stuff to pray about, too. It, it gets a little, um, I mean, it gets a bit heady and all, but uh, just like to get the concepts and just like take those four concepts and like take those to prayer. And it's a beautiful thing and just think like what is how did he do it what does that mean just thinking about how he saved us how do you make the covenant what's the, what's the church where's the church leading us it's like great stuff to to really the hopeful stuff uh to think about and pray about you know um in our day and age and in our, our struggle suffering that we may have is to think of how the lord delivers us how he comes among us okay what time is it like Seven thirty. No. Oh, oh, you're gonna weigh me down to seven point. <laughs> Didn't work. So, oh yeah. So I just wanted before we break up, this is pretty neat. This is uh. So people ask, like, um. So the Mashiach. So this is like from a, a Jewish um, perspective. So the Mashiach. So it kind of goes back to like the common belief. The Mashiach will be a great political leader, descended from King David. The Mashiach. Uh, he will be well versed. This is interesting stuff here. He will be well-versed in Jewish law and observant of its commandments. He will be a charismatic leader, inspiring others to follow his example. He will be a great military leader who will win battles for Israel. So this is all more of the King David side, right? He will be a great judge who makes righteous decisions. But above all, he will be a human being, not a God, demigod, or other supernatural being. So he's really, remember how the Lord gets in trouble with that. It's like equating himself to God, right? Right. Um, and all, also, although some scholars believe that God has set aside a specific date for the coming of the Mashiach, most authorities suggest that the conduct of mankind will determine the time of the Mashiach's coming. 
In general, it is believed that the Mashiach will come in a time when he is most needed because the world is so sinful, or in a time when he is most deserved because the world is so good. That's interesting. Two totally different perspectives. <laughs> One, it's like you guys are really sinful, so I'm coming in. You guys are amazingly holy, so I'm coming. Yeah. Um, and what this is interesting. What will the Mashiach do? Before the time of the Mashiach, there shall be war and suffering. This is out of Ezekiel. The Mashiach will bring about the political and spiritual redemption of the Jewish people by bringing us back to Israel and restoring Jerusalem. So there's this big thing on gathering the nations back to the holy land of Israel. So bringing them back to Israel, restoring Jerusalem, he will establish a government in Israel that will be the center of all world governments, both for Jews and Gentiles. He will rebuild the temple. Here we're talking about the new temple again and reestablish its worship. He talks a lot about that, right? Um, and he will restore the religious court system of Israel and establish Jewish law as the law of the land. So it's sort of like this centerpiece of reality of uh, of Israel is like he's like it, you know, like that's powerful to I mean that was a Jewish perspective here we come from. Um we would say like our Messiah comes in the center of creation is like Rome, right? Like the church and Rome and throughout the world, um, and, and like the Holy Father, that kind of thing. But then he says, uh, this kind of whoever's writing is a guy who um, the, the time of the Messiah will be characterized by, and this is when I talked to my great uncle, oh my great, my uncle, sorry, my Orthodox Jewish uncle, um, will be characterized by the peaceful coexistence of all people out of Isaiah 2 4. Hatred, intolerance, and war will cease to exist. And that's what my uncle's being like. We get talking about Jesus Messiah. He's like, hey, you got wars going on, you got this, you got that. And he said, when he comes, there'll be none of that. Some authority, and then I think more like he's talking about more when he comes again, you yeah. know, so more like the second coming. Some authorities suggest that the laws of nature will change so that predatory beasts will no longer seek prey and agriculture will bring forth supernatural abundance. But he said that could be just an image. And then he said all of the Jewish people will return from their exile among the nations to their home in Israel. The law of the Jubilee will be re reinstated. So it's just like this coming home, the gathering, the temple, the people, like everybody's looking there for all the, the wisdom and guidance. And the whole world will recognize the Jewish God as the only true God and the Jewish religion as the only true religion. There will be no murder, robbery, competition, or jealousy. There will be no sin. Sacrifices will continue to be brought in the temple, but these will be limited to Thanksgiving offerings. Like he said in here, the Todah. And because there will be no further need for expiatory offerings, like sin, sin offerings. And, and then he says, lastly, we believe that in the future time, everyone will simply know what the truth is the same way that we know that two plus two equals four, and there will no longer be any reason to argue about it. So a lot of times, like when I talk to my uncle, it's almost like the Lord comes and, and plants. I mean, he, the kingdom has come among us in seed. But the fruition of our of our belief, our kingdom is what they're talking about a bit more is like the second coming of the world of perfection. I mean, we have that in us to to work toward that, and you know, with God's grace, we'll see if we can do it. Uh, but it, a lot of times, it, it it reminds me of more of the the second coming world, where it's like the perfect, um, the you know, the kingdom in its fullness, and where there will be no more dying or sickness or murder and all that so i just i thought that was pretty interesting you know because sometimes people say like if he's talking about different perspectives of like what were the jewish people thinking well here's an article from the, the jewish people so it's right so all right so we're gonna we're gonna break it off here and then we'll give you some time for chapter uh or questions for uh, chapter two okay so if you guys you guys do it like in a group kind of thing yeah um okay you got five minutes no i'm just kidding. you guys i'll just kind of <laughs> so if you guys can kind of keep it online versus too many not too many tangents because we got to get back to chapter three thank you any questions about a thousand questions how about questions at home how do you know questions at home like how do they they were cast. 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 They were cast.
Oh, man. Are done. We must All right, the rest so we could do at home. Oh, yeah. You know, this stuff gets a little... Crazy. It gets really... You really well, it's the read thing it. is... Yeah, it's a, and it's a lot of... It's a lot of stuff. Of these it's a lot of stuff. I have this for 10 hours. <laughs> so anyway, um, so any Here. thoughts on on uh, uh, chapter two questions? So anybody... Oh, we covered some expectations, but anybody else hear anything else that over the years or something that... Kind of was different than Moses, David, Moses, some of the stuff we were already talking about. Anything else that you got to say? All the expectations. You know Describe like number four, how covenants are made. Well, let's just stick with one. Are we <laughs> number one? <laughs> it have to do. Sorry, I just want to go through one. Is there any anybody thoughts on? What's that? They said there were expectations of different people had different expectations. I just mm -hmm. assumed, okay, the Messiah would come. They're saying some thought he should be a military person. Yeah. yeah, I did not know that there were different expectations. Right? Yeah, and they're all like both in. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so that's the thing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if some of the scholars are stuck on like it was just this one, but like what he's saying, he's bringing out a couple. And those are uh, kind of the two main ones that that I see. I hear the other one was was heavily taught, like in the seminary stuff. So. But yeah, but they're all right. I mean, yeah, because it's the new Moses. Remember um, the mountain of the Beatitudes. The, the, yeah. the, you know, he's the new Moses, so he's given the the Beatitudes on the mountain there. So like getting the uh, you know, the covenant, the uh, Ten Commandments from the mountain. So he's like the new, and then he's a real Jewish. I mean, he's always Jewish, but the Mo, the Matthew one is the, the the new Moses. So in Matthew's Gospel, he's portrayed a lot as the the new Moses, and he's paralleling. He don't. He don't say, I mean, he might bring that out a little bit, here, but um, bringing out Jesus as the new the new Moses kind of thing. So yeah, so it's both and. I mean, the big King David thing's big too. You talk to the, the the Jewish people, and they're like, "Yeah, it'll be like a King David." And he brings that out here, or the other the other thing I read, um, it, you know, he'll be a new Davidic figure, like King David in the line of David. Um, he's referred to as Messiah Ben David, son of mm. David. But we see that lineage. Remember, we so go through the lineage. From that so yeah, so it is complex. It's very I mean, there's complex. a lot to it. So it's not like I don't know. It's not like a real simple i mean it is you know when you look at it and pray about and think about it I mean, you know the key is to get the the gist and, well, i had um, just an education that i was told that even the resurrection that they they were their own grouping of this sort of promise he made me die and move on to the uh kingdom of god and see it it's up to what happens to you after you die, because I always thought these people, it was this is it. You die. Yeah. You well, like the Sadducee. Well, like you're referring yeah. maybe the Sadducee said there was no resurrection. That's why an easy way to remember them. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the other one, Father Bober taught us that. Then the Pharisees would believe. So, yeah, there's different, yeah, different expectations. You're right on that. Yeah, and I would not be going to ask them how they see yeah they have an effort different yeah trying to capture the jewish notion of that then there's different sects of Jews, right right i mean that gets tricky because if you're talking to orthodox or you're talking to the um the liberal reform or conservative yeah so all right so anyway what uh exodus so we saw we kind of covered that second one you everybody good with that i think the key on that one to, to look at i think is an easy way to think about it is the preceding um, meal before the Exodus, right? So, like they're eating the the uh, the, the meal, the lamb, the, and then the Exodus happens after the meal, and then you have the Last Supper. So that's preceding the the new Exodus is Christ dying on the cross and rising. So I think that's a neat parallel to think about. So the preceding meal of that happening. But then obviously, well, we'll get into that later about how we commemorate it, too. I think that gets in this next show. Um, and then the new, and this is the, any new Moses, Jesus connections. I thought there was a lot of, you know, stuff we could pull on. Anything kind of strike you about 
you know, like the new Moses Jesus connection in that first one of anything. The transfiguration that was at the end of that chapter, since we yeah, just had yeah, we'll transfiguration, that. that was really. Yeah, something. you're right. When I was reading, I yes, I think it was was that chapter two or three? Mm -hmm. Chapter two. two it's yeah, yesterday right. I was reading. I was like, it's funny. We just had, we this. had <laughs> that. Awesome. See, we plotted that up. Yeah. Right. Um. But yeah. What. You know, what I was saying, you know, those apostles didn't know what rising from the dead was. They asked him, well, what do you mean, Jesus? Yeah. What are you talking about? They didn't get it yet. They didn't, right? They did not get it. But he rose from the dead. Um, but he kept trying to teach them. He, he tried to tell them in so many yeah, ways. Yeah, so the one says that they didn't know what rising from the dead. Mm -hmm. Especially the bodily resurrection. Yeah. I mean, that was... I mean, that was never done before. Even though he rose Lazarus, he brought him out of the tomb. Yeah, well, he died. He and died. Brought him back. Brought but that was the only place that died with the tomb. And on his own power. Yeah. Was, yeah. Whatever. The other thing with the, with the new Moses, and that kind of made sense from what I know, or what we all know, is that they said that the new Moses would walk, would enter on a donkey. Yeah. 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 You know, that was that kind of made sense too because that's when you know the Jewish people finally walked into Jews and they said, Oh, there's and most people said, Oh, there's the new Moses, you know, because that's what they were told. Yeah. Yeah, that's right in the prophecy for Zachariah you know, riding upon a phone. Yeah. Any other thoughts for that one? I like the one uh on twenty-six that the quote from Deuteronomy, Moses said to the Israelites, the Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brethren. Him you shall lead. And the Lord said to me, they have rightly said all that they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak all that I can read. So another delivery. Mm -hmm. All right. So in covenants, describe how there that was in there. Did you get the answer to that one? I think it was in the in the uh, italicized writing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're they're made they're made through what is it? Is it, it blood? Well, yeah, but yeah, the sacrificial worship. Sacrificial. So you're doing that sacrifice back to God, and blood is the life, the soul, yeah. and so that's how they're they're seal they're sealing these. And remember, he's sprinkling with the hyssop, hyssop which is yes. the, the wiring the plant right. and the blood. Right. We talked about that with the sort of the blood brothers. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord is going to seal the covenant in his blood. And we drink his blood, mm -hmm. right? Um, and why is the temple special? It said that it laid that out. That it's the, the, oh, no, no, the temp, the old temple. The like, old what, temple. What was it? It was the dwelling place of, of God the on earth. The dwelling place of God on earth. So that's how we have it. When you go into the church and you see a tabernacle, and Jesus is in the tabernacle. So his presence is in there in a special manner. In the promised land, who is invited and what will they do? So everybody's invited, right? <laughs> We're all called to be saved. All right. So you guys are a stellar class in here. Um, and so we'll go through it's kind of this might be a little quicker. <laughs> the uh, chapter, chapter three. three, yeah. Sorry, this is a lot of stuff. In this. It is a lot, it's a lot. To... So he gets in, and then you have a, your handy dandy overview here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he's talking about the new Passover. So we were talking about this already. If there's going to be a new Exodus, then it would seem that there would need to be a new Passover as well. Uh, so we talked about the preceding the meal, obviously, would be the last couple. Uh, he's establishing a new Passover, the long way for Passover, the Messiah. And it is the connection between the Last Supper and the new Passover that will provide us with our first clue. Skyly like makes a puzzle here, too, to answering the riddle of how Jesus could have commanded the disciples to eat his body and drink his blood. So that's a big thing in the book is like, why would the Lord do that if that wasn't a common practice? To you know, obviously flesh, but drink blood uh, too. Um, so the biblical roots of the Passover, uh, he, he's laying out, yeah, I don't know how exhausted we have to go into this, but um, you choose an unblemished male lamb, so the perfect 
uh, lamb that you choose, and it has three of defects, unblemished, in its prime, one year old male. Um, and then, and then that's neat too. He's making this distinction between the Exodus, the time of Exodus, and the time of Jesus, right? So that would be, uh, we said like uh, fifteen hundred years. You got Ralph, you could look online. It's a little sometimes like different. Abraham, let's see, roughly two thousand would be like seventeen fifty, but roughly an easy way is like two thousand fifteen hundred one thousand. So, and then the time of Christ, um, the the Passover is different. Remember, so he has those distinctions there. So um, we have the unblemished lamb, the sacrifice of the lamb. So each house, and this was neat too with the priestly action. So all fathers of each household could sacrifice the lamb because they all were within the 12 tribes and they were, uh, that's when they were together and they would have the priestly power back then. Remember? I think that's one of your study questions here, but they'd have the priestly power to do that. So at that time, uh, every man, father and son, so that every man would act as a priest over his own household by both selecting and sacrificing the Passover lamb. Um, and then that changes. He lays out the it was more just the, the priestly uh, class, the tribe of Levi. It's interesting. My mom, so my grandfather would be a Levi. So he, so my mom's maiden name is Levine. Uh, so I always like think about that. Wow, I'm a Levine. Um, <laughs> So uh, in the wake of this tragic <laughs> event, oh, so he's just talking about like their dean uh, ministry comes along. But at the first Passover wasn't so, it was just, you know, the, the father. And spread of the blood of the lamb on the door. Uh, so it gets pretty pretty detailed here. The cutting of the lamb for the animal's throat and drain of blood and sacred vessel. Some sort. So it's kind of be the sacred vessel at the head of the, the um, chalice years later would be the Lord's blood and chalice. And three things we're noting here, the blood of the lamb was poured into the basin. Uh, the blood of the lamb was to be spread on the wood of the doorpost and lentils. And this, and then the hyssop, remember the, the wiry bush or plant. And then, so this last one is, for now, the main point is that the ultimate goal of the Passover sacrifice, as well as its ultimate effect, was deliverance from death through the blood of the lamb. So that sounds familiar. And then eat the flesh of the lamb. And he really draws on this. This was interesting uh, to eat the flesh. So he's saying that to eat the flesh completed the sacrificial death of the lamb, which is interesting. So you just didn't have like the, the sacrifice uh, lamb, but to complete that, you had to eat the lamb. So he's big on pulling that all together with the Lord, um, you know, his, his, you know, why would he have them uh, eat his body like that, drink his blood? So eat the flesh of the lamb. So he talks about that. And this is the time of the Exodus, like way back. And bitter herbs we know from like our Seder meal worlds and things. So that's the wandering in the desert. The Passover sacrifice was, no, oh, not complete until the death of the lamb, but by eating its flesh. You got to eat that. And then he also uses, but by a communion roast. And keep the uh, Passover as a day of remembrance. So that's important too. I'm sure you, you heard of that before. But so what they're talking about is in the Jewish time and also the our Eucharist is, so it's not like just historically that you do that, but you also, I mean, you do that historically to do what they did, to, you know, remember what they did. But it's also like, remembering what they did but it's also bringing it making it present so remember like when we celebrate the eucharist uh the the cross is represented we've heard that before yeah. so when we sell when they are celebrating this they're actively uh participating getting into that moment and saying oh like this is who we are this is our identity this is what god did for us thousands of years ago but it's also happening like right now. It's made present, so I get, I understand it. It's a, it's a, a, a living relationship with God, and this gives me my identity, who I am. So the same thing with the Eucharist is we come to Mass, we celebrate around the altar of the Eucharist, and like Christ crucified. It's it, that happened one time in history, but in mystery, it's represented where it's actively occurring right now. His saving actions. So like when you go to mass 
it's like wow i'm like entering it oh like christ wow he died on the cross for me like it's it's like happening right there and, and i can see the lord dying on the cross and my sins are forgiven and i'm going to heaven and i have a whole new way of living life so like that's all made present so it's like you know you never go to mass the same way that if you're just like kind of oh yeah i'm going to mass i'm going to on my day it's like wait like i was there it was amazing like christ was crucified and rose and like i received him he died for me my sins are forgiven i'm going to heaven i'm living out the covenant here we go you know that was an amazing hour right so that's like you got to go to mass it was like and then the other thing he doesn't get into but heaven and earth heaven opens up you know the roof of the church comes off and then you're at the heavenly realm already there's a lot of things happening in mass, right? so then you're at the heavenly realm already because christ would not when you're talking about the real presence of jesus you're talking about the union with him now so like and he doesn't come alone so like the angel the father the holy spirit all the angels and saints would be with him and you would be at the eternal banquet at mass so that's what you remember the, the lamb supper book scott Hahn. He, he didn't invent this is from the church but he was good at bringing it out but the church has always said that in the book of revelation that that's where heaven meets earth the mass so that's another just kind of thing to think about uh, when you come to mass so there's a lot going on at mass like we can't have it confined to you know to, like all the unimportant details of mass you know who's here what am i wearing what am i doing after mass how do i get my hoagie um, <laughs> no offense to hope but we have the practical realities so, but when you get there, it's like, whoa, you know, we got like takeoff. Like, this is like amazing. Like, this is all happening at this place, you know? Um, like everybody, if we all saw that everyone would be going to mass. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So anyway, so that's the point with the, with the same thing with the pastor. But that's what he's talking about here. When he's talking about um, remembering. So, well, and then he gets into the differences, Passover, Jesus' time, uh, Passover, uh, sacrifice so that remember he's talking about sacrificing two hundred thousand lambs and i mean can you imagine that at that time frame i don't know what they did with the smells and things yeah. Like yeah i mean i don't know i mean i don't know how they did it or what kind of system of cleansing maybe they had a cleansing system uh, 200 000, two for two million people i mean it was a different world back then too yeah. like hygiene and stuff like that yeah but yeah. yeah, that's amazing. To think about. Now what's common? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so you're getting into the sacrifice of the of the lamb, uh, and then oh, this is interesting on um, sacrifice versus the seder meal. So, yeah. however, one key way the modern Jewish seder is fundamentally different from the first century Jewish Passover is that the Jewish seder meal is not a temple sacrifice. So they're not. Um, the temple is not active, like in that sense, like offering sacrifice, and it's not, it's not the new, like as they're seeing, like a temple reestablished. So there's not sacrifice there. So that's interesting, though. That's actually called because I kind of knew this, but just uh, talked to my uncle before because I had two questions about the seder or the you know, was um one was like when we go to have the Orthodox uh, seder meal at his house and then when they say like in the evening it's always the evening because yeah. it's like late at night yeah you have these other like you know to like get on other people's seder meals they're down yeah. at five o'clock looking for questions on you're eating by six i mean when i go to that one you're eating the meal like at least quarter to 11 and you're like <laughs> i'm not even hungry at this point <laughs> so when i heard the evening i was like amen to that that is like you're in there like when are we going to eat i gotta go home but anyway, so they they get home from the shore, but it must be eight thirty nine. Uh, there's an hour long, but it's a beautiful thing. But anyway, but so they don't eat lamb. They, I mean, they're able to eat lamb, but at the Passover they don't eat lamb. And I said, and I thought I knew the answer, but I, you know, I did. But I just wanted to hear with him, and he said that um, because there's no sacrifice going on at the temple, so they're basically chicken and stuff because I, I never know. at my uncle my aunt uncle's never orthodox they would never have land with that and oh. i was like so i was, and then it's because the temple's not active so when oh. the if the temple were active they were sacrificing then they would be you, know, oh. you can eat lamb outside yeah. of that but yeah. that night that so it's night interesting you mean oh. when you say not active 
so they're not sacrificing lambs. You said the temple is not active. Yeah, it's not like the, what, what, the what, what staff, like he, like um, the temple, like uh, Solomon's temple. Okay. So and when you go to Israel, it's like yeah, it's not like an active. It's like a, a they visited. They have the Wailing Wall is like the outside. Okay. Right. Yeah, so it's not like it's. I mean, you know, sadly enough, it's um. So in seventy A.D., um, that was wiped out. The Rome was going to wipe them out. I mean, and so they destroyed that. You know, it's non-destroyed. Rule working, not as destroyed. Yep. So they would have to have it rebuilt. So right now, for two thousand years, it's a, um, it's we have a wailing wall outside of it, and I don't know wailing maybe because there's no Babylonian temple there. Uh, I mean, there's remnants of it, but so this not, yeah. So if you go like online and look at like Solomon's <laughs> temple and see what that thing is, this mass, like it would be something like our Vatican, like you know, some like if our Vatican wasn't, it, would, it wouldn't happen until Christ comes again. But like if that was like, you imagine that place like not active. Or something. So that's what it is to them. It's just like this destroyed, not active. Hmm. Um, so anyway. And and uh, where are we are, oh, said it So that's interesting because there's no sacrifice coming. And yeah, this gets into 70 AD. Historically, this difference is the result of the fact that 40 years after the death of Jesus, 70 AD, the Roman army came and destroyed the Jerusalem temple. Because from that day until our own, it has never been rebuilt. Because of this, all of the blood sacrifices commanded in the Mosaic law have ceased. Um, so, yeah, the, it's just uh, not, I mean, you could visit it. And then we have the crucifixion of the Passover lambs. Oh, that was interesting. How yeah. Was, oh, yeah. That was grown. Yeah, so you put like the, the like yeah. spits on them or sticks. Yeah. Them and, and they put it in the, the shape of a cross, the way yeah. they spread yeah, it yeah. out. I never really, I, I didn't, didn't hear that. that before. I never heard that. that. Yeah, so that was interesting. I never heard that before, so I read it here. Dressed up in the form of a cross. And a participation in the first Passover. So this gets into what we talked about the on 65, the double remembering. So you have the double element, both of remembering the past and making it present came to be expressed by various rituals according to ancient Jewish um, and then this gets into some of the questions that they'll ask. So it's, we talked about that already, just making it all present as we do at Mass. And the Passover of the Messiah. Uh, so this gets into the Lord's, look at 67. All of these rabbinic traditions are apparently based on the fact that in the Bible, the night of Passover is called a night of watching. The first Passover was a night of watching for the coming of the destroying angel. In later Jewish tradition, the Passover became a night of watching for the coming of the Messiah and the redemption of the Um, So they're looking ahead to see. Oh, so that's the other one. It's you probably heard of this. Uh, he didn't mention this one, but I, I guess he covers it here. Is so at the Jewish uh, Passovers, they'll have a chair for Elijah, right? So Elijah is to come before and, and prepare the way for the Messiah. So, like symbolically, at a Jewish Passover. There'll be an empty seat for Elijah. Oh, okay. And so we would say that Elijah in the New Testament would be who? John the Baptist. Right. So John, John the Baptist was the, 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 the forerunner. Yeah, yeah. forerunner of Jesus. So that that's what they're getting to here is this this new Passover, looking at looking forward to the future. All right, and and we talked about this the preceding. Uh, the Jewish and the Jesus and the new Passover. So we see the connections between these meals preceding uh, the, uh, the events. So like the, the Passover meal, then the Exodus, the Last Supper, then the, um, G, the new Exodus, Christ dying on the cross. And then this part here is where he, this gets kind of tricky a little bit, but he's drawing these inferences here. <laughs> they, I, I mean, I follow it, but He's talking uh, 70 and 71. Uh, Jesus acted as host and leader of the 12, even though he was not the father of any disciples. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that why would they have his, him eat his uh, flesh? And he's equating that 
uh, with the lamb a sacrifice. So they were eating the lamb. And Jesus, he's not referring to like the Jewish prayers of the Passover, where he's referring to himself, like his body, his blood. So what he's saying is there that the take and eat, this is my body. He's supplanting like the the um, the lamb for himself. So that's why he would have you eat his flesh, the lamb, and, and I mean the bread too. He gets into that in the next chapter. But he's saying that he's the sacrificial lamb that you would eat, and he in his blood you would drink. So that's in uh, 71, 72. Um, and in short, by placing his own body and blood at the center of this new Passover, Jesus revealed that he saw himself as the new Passover lamb. This is interesting. Lutheran scholar Joachim Jeremias said more than 50 years ago, by the means of his actions in the upper room, Jesus was saying, I go to death as the true Passover sacrifice. With these words, Jesus revealed that he saw himself as the unblemished male lamb that would be put to death so that others might live. And so he closes it out with, you have to eat the lamb. I love these titles. You have yeah, to eat the yeah, lamb. Um, but anyway, if you ever read Scott Hahn, he really has some cool yeah, titles. He has each, some cool, each topic he has is good like these cool topics. And he's very easy to read and understand. Yeah, this guy's it's just this guy's good. It's just like he's it's heavy. It's just, it's just like all off. common. Yeah, it all starts like running together. <laughs> he also saw himself as the new Passover lamb who would be sacrificed in order to inaugurate the new Exodus and his blood would be poured out for the forgiveness of sin. So remember we talked about that you had the sacrificial lamb, but to complete the sacrifice, you had to eat the lamb. So that's what he's saying here is you have to to complete the Lord's sacrifice, you have to, to eat the lamb, right? And it's also, you know, I'll just read this. You guys go with me. In order to fulfill God's law, in order to be saved from death, you had to eat the lamb. As with the old Passover, the first Exodus, so with the new Passover of the Messiah. The main difference between the two is that in the new Passover, the lamb is a person, and the blood of redemption is the blood of the Messiah. And then to top it off here, St. Paul, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The cup of blessing which we bless is not a communion in the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is not a communion in the body of Christ. So he's drawn this um, to eat the, yeah, he will eat his body, but he's saying that he's the, he's the sacrificial lamb, and that's the timing of eating the Eucharist here. So... Sound good? <laughs> All right. So you guys are an amazing uh, crowd to thank. No, so we have these other ones to do. So we'll, uh, we'll we'll come back at the end, too, and have a little time. And then I know, yeah, sorry if it runs a little bit. Yeah, feel free. Obviously, we'll dock your grade if you leave, but no, we can't. Um, but feel free if you have to leave, but you have to leave. But we won't be too much longer than maybe a little longer than 15. What time is it? Whoa! <laughs> I don't, we'll do. You guys want to do some of the questions a little bit, or no? It's okay. I don't care. Okay, we'll do some. Whoever can stay, we'll do some of the questions, and then we'll wrap it up after that. <laughs>
How do I get my? Like, how do you know you're watching? Like my clock. Everybody out there, okay, in TV land. Hello, everybody. I wish you were here. I'm expecting you're on question seven already. Second one of these. Oh. All right, folks, so we'll uh, bring it back in and we'll just kind of fire through some and, and if any questions at the end. So biblical step of Passover, were you most familiar and least familiar with? Any idea, any thoughts on that? Like, I, I know you've heard or been at Seder meals, but anything that were um, most and least, anything stand out to you? Like, I'm surprised you said that your family, you know, they don't eat lamb. Yeah. I was well, my I family, thought they all ate lamb. They're Orthodox. So oh. like my so if it was so growing up, we didn't really over, well, yeah, we did this with grandpa we read the questions. Yeah. yeah. Um I can't recall, I guess we had lamb then. So maybe conservative, but Orthodox, they're all Orthodox and they they're, they're eating like chicken and all that. I said, why don't we eat lamb? And yeah. he said, because the temple's yeah, not well, built. So right. they're not yeah. sacrificing yeah. lamb. Okay. So that's a and then See, that well when I asked him tonight, he said, Well, when the, the Messiah comes, <laughs> like, you know, and then I said, Well, I beg to differ. <laughs> um, so uh so he just yeah, so it's just the not the messianic age. Yeah, you know? okay. So they're just doing that as okay. why would you if you're not able to sacrifice okay. and do what God calls you to do, why would you? That's the orthodox. That's the orthodox. So, like, if you're talking reformed conservative, like I would like bet they're all so eating lamb. Sorry, so they would probably all be eating lamb. Orthodox are, you know, it's amazing though, too, the orthodox, how much we have in common with, with the them. orthodox. So, if I walk into a reformed house mm -hmm. as a priest and, um, like, we would, we would be probably, I mean, I don't want to say each one of them, but, um, you could be on, all way over the spectrums. If I walk into the Orthodox house with all the Orthodox Jews, and I grant them, and clerics is a priest, so they kind of do like a little bit of a double take, like okay. yeah. your relatives. <laughs> What's a priest. he doing here? But after that, we're on the money on everything: really? abortion, everything. gay marriage. Yeah, they're raped out. And you're like sitting there talking with them about that, and you're just like, it's like it's all right there. Talk about brothers gathered. You yeah. talk about all those issues that we're on the same page and they're just like they're you you feel raided right home real yeah. fast we start bringing up hey what's about what are you guys on pro-life where are you guys on mm -hmm. marriage and between you know, guy and a woman or guy and you're you're all in maybe it's amazing <laughs> the orthodox out there um you know right there with it but uh so yeah you so when you became a priest relatives did they, did they uh, <laughs> well they well yeah they kind of they were orthodox at that time so um my mom was real is real supportive but they were like kind of taken aback but then they were kind of fine. i mean they're not like coming to mass and like that kind of thing but uh but they're he's asking um you know what my orthodox side so yeah i think they're more taken aback but they I mean they love me but remember they, what you told me what your mother said the thing that bothered her is when you got baptized it you was, told me that. Which one was it? Was it? You, a long time ago, I asked you, what did yeah. your mother say when you were going to be a priest? And, and she was concerned about you being baptized because the Jewish people don't baptize. Yeah, so my mom was more concerned about me being a, a baptized mm -hmm. than priest. So once I was, <laughs> when I was getting baptized, I was 19 in college. And so I was through Central Catholic. And then I went to high school there. And then she got to know a Christian brother, a good friend of my brother, Clement Smith. Uh, so then um, when I was baptized, she was like nervous that I would be like different or see my mom differently. Yeah. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Yeah. So by the time like we got kind of through that and saw like I was doing well, I was happy. It was, <laughs> and then by the time it was like moving in the priesthood, I remember uh, I was because they didn't really know what was going on. So yeah. I was 19. Then I was 
I went to the seminary in 26, but I used to, and not like my habits were changed. Like I wasn't like going out on the town, my friends, I can't. <laughs> And so, like, I would sit at home and I would be watching. Remember Cardinal World, Bishop World, oh, like, yeah. the show? Yeah. Remember that show, Teachings of Christ? Yeah. So um, he uh, has a show. He would come on, like, repeat, like, at whatever yeah. time. And so I'd be sitting there watching it. And, like, she comes bopping in. And they knew World, like my dad. Yeah. So she said, uh, were you watching Cardinal, you know, Bishop World? I was like, yeah, it's a great show. And she's like, uh, did you ever think about being a priest? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, um, uh, nah, 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 not, not really, you know, meanwhile, I'm like, yeah, kind of, but, um, so anyway, that's a whole nother that's story. That's another story. But anyway, good question, good question. So by the way, a uh, little bit of trivia. So over the last, like, month, um, I reached out to Cardinal World, so he calls, uh, he called uh, my mom. Yeah, so, so nice. So they go way back, but he was talking with her, and then he calls me, like, three weeks later, and he said, Father Terry, I want to check on how's your mom. Aww. And he's so smart that this was a Tuesday and he knows I go home Wednesday. So he <laughs> said, how about if I call tomorrow? <laughs> so he talked to her the next day too. But she's amazing. I mean, he's amazing. Then my mom said to him to Whirl, I was like, well, I'm scared. And then Cardinal Whirl said, well, Judy, you have nothing to worry about. Aww. She said, you lived a your beautiful life. You're faithful. Look at what you leave behind. So she really, and then she, he, she said to him, your voice is so soothing. <laughs> but anyway, so that's a blessing. So I really took a lot of time on that story. But anything else on, on this stuff? Um, so anyway, who offers the sacrifice of why? We talked about that, the fathers, and then it went to the priestly caste. Then who was the, the effect of the lamb's blood? Was What was the effect of the lamb's blood? It was deliverance from... Yes. Death. Death, right. Yes. And then explain the importance of eating the lamb. So it completed the Passover mm -hmm. sacrifice. And what was most striking about Passover at the time of Jesus for you? Anything? The crucifixion of the lambs is what we talked about. Oh, yeah. yeah. Crucifying lambs. And he's saying in there, we don't know for sure, but the Lord himself would have saw that happening like oh well, it's gonna be me one day you know yeah so any other thoughts on that and and also what does participation mean we kind of got into that a lot with the yeah and then yeah we uh we take and eat and then that leads us to remember right mm -hmm. so so participating we're actually doing it and like we go to mass and we pray and we receive the lord and then we remember, and then we get our identity. That's neat to think about, because I think we could take our faith uh, for granted that we just kind of like go to mass and then go home. I think it's in there that we're we're getting our identity back. But that's, I mean, if you've been a, you know, say if you've been away or something, come back to church, you really would feel that. Say like, well, oh, like this is what Jesus did. This is who I am. This is how I'm living. Like so, every time we're coming, um, it re-identifies who we are. Um, you know, so, all right. And how does Jesus's celebration of Passover point to the Eucharist? So I think we've been talking about that a lot. Um, so we got that down. Um, so any other general things? I know it's been, it's been a crazy night here, but uh, any other things? Yeah, I know it's kind of heavy and it's kind of a lot in a short period of time. Yes. Okay, let's go back again. So Jesus was being raised with Jewish tradition. So he's waiting for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. At what point is, is Jesus, as Jesus is being raised in Jewish tradition, so he is actually God, he knows it's going to happen, he knows that he's the new Passover. So, I mean, I don't understand what that is. Yeah, we wouldn't know the exact point. Yeah. Remember, he was human and divine. Method. It gets tricky. Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't know. Knows so it's a mystery. Yeah, we would get into, the. I mean, yes, you know, when he's like, um, you know, uh, one year old running around, right? I, I, you know, I mean, like, so it's he is divine and all again human. So I think he would be growing into that, but he, we don't know exactly what point, but I mean, he would, he would start putting us all together. So. Yeah, exactly. So we don't. 
Yeah. So yeah, yeah I don't know the exact time that that will occur, but that gets tricky because yeah. he has. If you go through the scriptures, there's a whole thing on the catechism on that. He's human and divine, so there's things that he would say like only God the Father knows this hour, and then he would have, and then these other things he would have supernatural knowledge as the thing. So right. it's kind of it's kind of like mixing around both of them. But he would definitely have grown in experience. Yeah. So he would not have come and said, you know, like I don't know exactly how they did it back then, but um, you know, you got to brush your teeth. Like he would come out, hey, you know, like three months old, hey, give my toothbrush, and they, yeah, they, you know what I mean. So he's like growing into like those kind of things of human realities like that. Uh, but he has divine knowledge too, so it's kind of this, this mixed bag. There's a good thing, yeah. The Catechism lays that out to the, to an extent, mm -hmm. and they'll give you examples like here was his divine knowledge like and then here was his human knowledge mm -hmm. where he was like shown a limitation but then he was shown his 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 um superior insight here so they kind of like go back and forth to it like but he definitely had to experience and grow yeah. you know like the common they like working with uh saint joseph um mm -hmm. you know i don't think he would have got there and whatever it's seven eight years old and say hey let me show you how to do it like i like yeah. i invented this stuff here you know right. Right. <laughs> you would have been more yeah. like joseph like you know hey and, you know showing you take how this to do it and you move right this here and this you know that so it's hard to like know exactly how this all occurred but so that that kind of experiential mm -hmm. knowledge and even knowing human matters and mm -hmm. things like that but he had divine insight into godly matters though so I Oh, you were saying about when he was 12 and 1 and his temple. My own little pen test. You know, Mary said to him, his mother Mary said to him, now is my son. Mm -hmm. It was like her and Joseph were to pull the reins on this divinity thing. He immediately paid attention to his parents. He, he was baptized, went out to the by dawn, did his 40 days of contemplating. Now, whoa, this this voice came out and said, This is my beloved son. And then Mary shows up at the marriage of Canaan and said, Now is the son. You know, it, it was almost like God had that special role with Mary Joseph in guiding this human that had divine counseling to the right time. Yeah, and they're the perfect parents to do it. Yeah. yeah. So uh yeah, so well, once Saint, yeah, his real sense. his active the active public ministry begins at the death of John the Baptist. Yeah. So like once Saint John the Baptist dies, that starts his public ministry, and that's and he's the forerunner too, you know, on um, St. John the Baptist. So once he dies, he starts his public ministry. And then the first miracles you mentioned is the wedding at Cana. Mm -hmm. um, so that starts the first of the signs in St. John's mm -hmm. gospel, he calls it. But um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, good point. Yeah, it's all neat how it all pointed. We got it all pointed. <laughs> yeah. I asked Father last week. Yeah. If you could. Do you ever think about living back in the time of Jesus? How you would have felt? Do you think that you would have believed, or do you think that you would have thought maybe he was a magician, charlatan? Well, yeah, it's a great, great yeah, question. I said I would have probably ran away. I like to think I would have believed, but <laughs> yeah, through God's grace, you know, no, I mean, not. we don't. Yeah, it's all. I mean, it's grace too. Like you, you try your best to be open to things, or not just in the matter of Jesus, but in life. You know, like yeah. so many times that we can miss the point like even right now is there any like that's what landscape is there any blindness that i suffer is there anything that i miss is so like we always try to be open on our end but then like god's grace and invitation too am i open to that invitation like what could god be inviting me to right now that i might be like saying yeah like i'll do that or i might say like i don't want to do i don't that. know about that <laughs> uh, so he comes back like what be here now <laughs> no, you'll know when he's coming. You'll know when he's coming. Well, that's the second coming. Well, he's among us. Yeah, he but, is. But okay. his, you'll know when he like yeah. officially comes back. That'll be the new heaven and the new earth. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mary, 
But no, it's an interesting question. I think it's always neat to uh, think about the historical Jesus. I think he brings that out here, like that first shop in Andrew Sunday. Um, but yeah, I think it's always neat to have that sense of the historical Jesus. I mean, we're just not like historians on it because the Lord, he comes you at you in history and mystery. Mm -hmm. But I think there is something to be said about the historicity. Like even if you read about her, it, there's so much good stuff like online. If you go to put in like, uh, you know, places to visit of Jesus and then mm -hmm. they have like all, whatever the sites are, but like the Holy Land visit sites and you could they'll line up like, you know, 40 things of you could see, you could pull it up and see it and they talk about it. But I always find that neat. I mean, I'm blessed to be there, but uh, it's a, that's a powerful website. You know, there's a lot on that, whatever they call it, like Holy Land. There's a couple of them, but they do a nice job with that. They'll say like, they'll show you the pictures of what it looks like now. They'll say the significance, they'll put the scripture on it, but there's something like really beautiful haunting about it too. Like as there's always something haunting about like any history if you know what i mean like you see somebody wore that shirt you're like wow what's it like you know um but so you think of like the lord himself and these places and you'll see them like on there i mean it's yeah if you're able to go i mean i'd go but uh otherwise if you're looking online there's so many neat things that, that really pull you in and it really gives you a different perspective on the scriptures so like yeah. even looking online on whatever it's called, like Holy Land, like sites to visit or something, you'll see it's really cool. They'll have like all the listing, you'll say Transfiguration, um, the wedding at Cana, and you pull it up and they'll show what's there, the churches, the this, the how it looks. And uh, I always find that powerful. So when I do those trips, I, I always pull those up ahead of time, <laughs> read up all about them. So, I, you know, I kind of get a sense of it all. But anyway, so any other? Yes. Uh, number five says, why is a temple special? God will glorify his temple. God will glorify his head in the book. Five. Uh, yeah. Daniel 5. Why is the temple special? Well, it says in the book, God will glorify his temple. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it, the book, yeah, God glorifies it. it. It's the dwelling place of God that they are. But yeah, he glorifies it by his presence. So, all right, it looks like we're wrapping it up. So why don't we, uh, we'll close with a prayer. So everybody, if you'd like to uh, grab the next. So you have the fourth uh, chapter on here. Yeah. And so that's for next week. And then I'll be, I have Fridays, which is this same one. So you're more than welcome to come again. Uh, so that's noon on Friday at St. Patrick's. And then the fourth chapter will be next week. Monday and Friday again, but you at least you have that. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together on this night. We ask that you bless us to know you more and more clearly and more and more dearly. Uh, it's always uh, faith, you know, seeking greater understanding here. Lord, please help us, and we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, Mother of God. Very May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yes. And we say goodbye to people on the Zoom. That blessing was for you, too. Thank you, Father.